morning. I ought to have shared a second joy. We are totally moved into our new place, which is a quarter of the size of our old place, and we have too much stuff, or at least I'll speak for myself, I have too much stuff. So it was, it was quite a feat. But we're moved in. It's a great joy. So it's a Father's Day today, and I'm a father. 39 years ago, my daughter Zakia was born. And you know the definition of grandfather? It's grand to be the father of a mother. It's grand to be the father of a father. And I have been made a grandfather by my daughter Zakia and my son Isa. And I have six grandchildren. You've heard me very often hold forth about how vital it is for us to resurrect feminine divinity. The complementarity of the female and male is something I want to celebrate today. Because women is dignified by true men, and men are dignified by true women. And Father's Day is a great joy of rejoicing, a, a great day of rejoicing. And I want to focus particularly on a great Unitarian Universalist minister, John Haynes Holmes. I term him the father of peace because of all of the contributions, and he, he made many contributions to world culture and to our great tradition. He is most well known for his radical nonviolence, his embrace of radical nonviolence. So we heard about Julia Ward Howe and how she was responsible for inaugurating Mother's Day. And she termed it Mother's Day of Peace. And she insisted that women who remember motherhood, women who remember what it means to be a mother, cannot but absolutely reject war as the solution to human problems. Well, John Haynes Holmes felt as strongly as she did, and he put himself at great risk as a minister to make it abundantly clear that he dedicated himself completely to peace, love, and understanding between human beings as the right way to solve our problems, however great and taxing those problems may be. Now, when my son Tamal, so I have a 39-year-old, I have a 37-year-old, I have five grandsons and a grandchild, and I have a six-year-old child. I guess I'm nuts. <laughs> But I do remember vividly when Tamal was born. First of all, I remember the many weeks and months of different challenges that my wife faced. Bearing a child, keeping a child nine months under her heart. Okay? It was not always easy. It was always sacred. It was always divine. And it made a deep impression on me how difficult how much sacrifice is involved with being a mother or being a father. And then when Tamal actually came into the world, it was three days of labor. And again, my wife faced moments of real difficulty and challenge, which she passed through very gracefully and courageously and joyfully. But it was difficult sometimes. And when the, our child was born and we had the miracle of his person with us, I was talking to my daughter Zakia and I was saying, sweetheart, you know, when you, when you become a parent, when you make the sacrifices that are involved in bringing a child up through the years, giving them values, modeling for them goodness and truthfulness and beauty, you just completely shudder at the idea that you would send your daughter or your son to a battlefield to get blown up or to blow up some other son or daughter of some other mother and father who cherish their children the way I cherish mine and the way you parents cherish yours. And those of you who don't have biological children, I bet you are mothers and fathers to someone. You have been somewhere, somehow, sometime a father or a mother to someone. You don't have to biologically give birth to understand 
nurturance, investment, and love for another. So my daughter agreed that yes, it's a betrayal of parenthood to endorse wars. And yet we see drone bombing going on, hot wars all over the planet, torture chambers and such. John Haynes Holmes powerfully stood against this. Let's look a little bit about details of his life. He was born November 29th, 1879. He died in 1964 in April. He was a Unitarian minister, he was a social activist. He loved music and poetry. He wrote over a hundred hymns, okay? Um, I didn't look, I wouldn't be amazed, but that one or more of them is in our hymnal, I don't know. But he's remembered for his pacifism, for founding civic organizations that are still important today. ACLU, he was one of the founders of the American Civil Liberties Union, NAACP. He was one of the founders, along with the boys, of this still vital and very important organization. Mind you, these were um, sort of radical and dangerous positions to take for a man born in 1879, to champion the human rights of blacks, or to say that the working people who don't have a lot of money have civil rights, and even if they can't afford a great lawyer who can get them off, they should be defended and protected. These are contributions for which he's remembered. He wrote a book in conjunction with a rabbi friend. And on the eve of World War I, he delivered a sermon, which I'll read from. This was April 1st, 1917. The nation entered the war the next day. His position, which you'll hear, was not popular. Even within his church, it was not popular. And within the American Unitarian Association, it was not popular. I quote, War is an open and utter violation of Christianity. If war is right, then Christianity is wrong false, a lie. If Christianity is right, then war is wrong, false, a lie. The God revealed by Jesus and by every great spiritual leader of the race is no God of battle. He lifts no sword. He asks no sacrifice of blood. His law, as interpreted and promulgated by the Nazarene, is, quote, love one another, end quote. Resist not evil with evil, Overcome evil with good, love your enemies. Such a God and such a law, others may reconcile with war if they can, I cannot. And what I cannot do, I will not profess to do. We all love Dr. Seuss. Hmm? Uh, the kids know Dr. Seuss. We know Dr. Seuss. But during this period of time, Dr. Seuss took vitriolic aim at Reverend Holmes. He caricatured him in cartoons, he lampooned him, and he disparaged him radically. And you can go online and see some of the depictions. Um, Dr. Seuss, like all of us, you know, is a complex character. And his depictions of the Japanese during uh, the war that we had, the Second World War, were really odious really racist, stereotypical, and hateful. And the vitriol that he aimed at Reverend Holmes was likewise odious. But John Holmes was never intimidated by that. In fact, he knew when he put together the sermon that I read briefly from, and it was a lengthy sermon, it was a different age. People, people uh, read and talked in a different style than we do. John Holmes knew that his board of directors of the church 
His congregation largely supported the war. He knew that he was putting his livelihood, his vocation at risk. But he felt the greater risk would be for me to not represent the vision that drew me to the ministry. And that is a vision of radical nonviolence. It's a way of transforming the world. Now, his board met the very next day. What are we going to do about this? Our parent organization is dead set against these kind of pronouncements and has directed us that if a minister comes forward for radical pacifism, that minister should be terminated from her or his position. I think in those days it was mostly his position. That church, Church of the Messiah, decided our tradition has a free pulpit and a free pew. The minister has a right to say what the minister believes is true. And even if we don't agree with it, we champion the right to say it. And for us to hear it and say we don't believe it, or we do believe it, or we'll think about it. And so they decided to retain his position. He said, well, that's not quite good enough. I want you not only to retain my position, but to allow me to advocate. And I think that we need to distance ourselves from the Unitarian organization that disparages the point of view of pacifism. Well, he got half of what he wanted. <laughs> the church insisted, no, we want to continue to be related to the parent organization. We believe in this great tradition, but we also believe in your right to speak and hold forth as you see fit. So, that's how they proceeded. Now, one of the extraordinary things about John Holmes is that he met Mohandas Gandhi. He was very, very inspired by Gandhi. He wrote a book called My Gandhi. I want to read that book. I plan to. Now, recently, Marguerite and Tamal and I went to Norman, Oklahoma. We spent two days listening to and speaking with Father John Deere. John Deere is a Jesuit. The Jesuits are really, they wish he wasn't. <laughs> they wish he wasn't a Jesuit. Why? Because he's like John Holmes, like Julia Ward Howe. Radical nonviolence is his credo. I listened to John Deere and I, and I loved him. I bought four books which I could hardly afford. <laughs> Uh, I listened to his story and I was moved by it, but I didn't totally agree with him. And, I, and this is an important part of my message today. For instance, one of the things that he said that I personally couldn't get behind, he said, if you can't love Hitler, you can't love anybody. I think, well, that's a pretty radical statement. I think that you can love people and think that you can't love Hitler. I can see that. Or again, that there is never, ever a time when a person should resist violence forcibly. I don't really agree with that. For example, if someone breaks... Now, an example I've given before. George Harrison, the Beatle. In the middle of the night, a demented, crazy man broke into his home. George went to see what was going on. And in the dark, he came upon this intruder who began to stab George in the chest. He punctured his lung. He nearly punctured his heart. George's wife, Olivia, heard the ruckus and went downstairs and with a table lamp beat the guy to unconsciousness and saved her husband's life. I don't interpret what Olivia Harrison did as violent. I consider that she quelled violence. It was an act of nonviolence because otherwise the father of her son, the beloved musician and lyricist George Harrison, would lay in a pool of blood dead on the floor. So, I don't agree with every aspect of what I heard John Deere say, and I dare say I wouldn't agree with everything John Haynes Holmes had to say every time I listened to him. But part of the vision that I got from being in the presence of John Deere, who I think is a great human being, is that he was saying, I am prepared to become a force in this world that will change this world like Gandhi changed the world. That's his election. That is his right. And what would the world be like 
if we didn't have people who were as moved as he was to make such a radical commitment. I was thinking about Martin Luther King. If Dr. King didn't believe in immortality of the soul, didn't believe in Jesus' divinity, and didn't believe in the revelations of the Bible, would he have acted the way he acted? Would he have galvanized the nation and the world to overturn a system of injustice that was in force for hundreds of years? I don't think so. Or Gandhi, who he championed, would Gandhi have had the moral force in the world that he had if he thought the Bhagavad Gita was just a bunch of words that had no meaning? I think not. Martin Luther King was unapologetically Christian. He derived strength and vision from his Christianity. So, Reverend Holmes was booted out of the AUA for decades, and his church supported him through those years. They changed their name to Community Church. And it's interesting, just before his death, the American Unitarian Association had a complete about face. And they said, you know what? You have really inspired us to rethink our commitment. Some of the biographers of Holmes point out that at first in his library, the theological books were right at hand. But later they became top shelf. And I don't mean in the sense that we usually mean top shelf. I mean they became remote. He was more interested in reading political books, books on social activism, books on socialism. He went so far as to say that he saw Jesus' ministry as socialist. He saw that Jesus wanted to make a, a, an equitable world where everyone was protected and everyone was safe and distribute wealth so that everyone is fed. And that became his, his overarching concern, his social activism. And the AUA said, you know what? You, you're right. We like what you are saying. We agree. And not only that, we made a mistake in issuing a mandate that if you're a Unitarian minister and you preach radical nonviolence, you're out. That's something we should never do again. We have to protect the free pulpit because otherwise there's no meaning to our tradition's power to transform the world. Again, from this April 1st speech in 1917. In time of war, as in time of peace, I shall love my country and serve her to the end. And how shall I, a pacifist, serve my country in time of war? If any man or boy in this church answers the call to arms, I shall bless him as he marches to the front. But I also have a conscience, and that conscience I also must obey. If this means imprisonment, I will serve my term. He modeled following your election, how you see yourself. Those who want to be a martial artist, I think of Terry Dobson. Terry Dobson spent years in Japan studying Aikido. And he, the most brilliant thing I've read of his is a report, I've shared it from this pulpit, where Dobson was sitting on a train, he was a young man, he'd been in training, oh, five, six years, every day working out, really strapping young athletic warrior. And he's saying, I just really was itching to have an opportunity to <laughs> kick some butt. <laughs> and the opportunity presented itself. Some crazy man, some drunken man, on the train that he was sitting, started harassing people pushing old women and men and slapping people. And Dobson got up and he started hulking over towards the guy and he said, one of us is going to perish. And I'll get to try out my mojo. And then just before the encounter, Dobson writes that this little Japanese man in a kimono calls the big drunk over and says, hey, so what's with you? Have a seat here. Talk to me. You've been drinking? 
Yeah, I've been drinking. Oh, I like to drink too. What do you like to drink? And he's engaged him in conversation. And in a few minutes, he had the man weeping on his lap because the man confessed, my wife just died. I've lost my job. I have, I have no self-respect. And without lifting a finger, the little Japanese man transformed a situation that could have led to bloodshed and carnage into civil discourse, loving exchange between human beings. Now, Terry Dobson didn't say, okay, after that, I don't want to study Aikido. He continued to study Aikido, and he became a master, and he opened a school, and he's well remembered for that. I think there need to be great persons who apply themselves to the martial arts and who if somebody rushed into this church would not rush the other way but rush up to the challenger and say here I am and you can't harm these people because here I am. That's a good election in my estimation. But for those who want to elect as Gandhi did, as Holmes did, as John Deere has, as Dan Berrigan has, to say you can kill me, you can imprison me, but I will not be violent. Because I believe that there's a better way. And I live in that belief, and I will die in that belief, and there's nothing that can change it. This is, this is Unitarian Universalism. We believe that everyone should follow their conscience. Everyone should follow their passion. Everyone should be as they believe is true and beautiful to be. We need diversity. The rose has perfume, and it has little swords that we call thorns. It has soft petals, and it has a green channel. One of the hymns that he wrote, this is the lyric, God of the nations near and far, Ruler of all mankind, bless thou thy people as they strive, the paths of peace to find. The, class, the clash of arms still shakes the sky, king battles still with king, wild throughout the frighted air of night, the bloody, I don't know what that word is, T-O-C-S-I-N-S, Tucson's? I don't know. It means weapons or something, ring. But clearer far the friendly speech of scientists and seers, the wise debate of statements, of statesmen and the shouts of pioneers. And stronger far the clasped hands of labor's teeming throngs who in a hundred tongues repeat their common creeds and songs. From shore to shore the people call in loud and sweet acclaim. The gloom of land and sea is lit with Pentecostal flame. O oh, Father, from the curse of war, we pray thee, give release. And speed, O oh speed, the blessed day of justice, love, and peace. Dr. King changed the world by his radical nonviolence, by his willingness to be a sacrifice. By his stand, he understood, I will change the hearts of a great deal of humanity. I will transform them from hateful, violent people into compassionate and loving people, which was the vision that he had that slumbering inside that heart are the seeds of love and compassion and peace. Dr. King confessed in writing that he could not fully embrace Christianity until he saw the example of Mohandas Gandhi, and so he made pilgrimage to that land of India. And he wrote, the greatest Christian of the 20th century was not a Christian, but his name was Mohandas Gandhi. And he empowered me to mount my mission. This is our tradition. John Holmes was one of the first to recognize Gandhi, to champion Gandhi, and to emulate Gandhi. And he paid dearly for his lack of moderation. He never bit his tongue. He just told it like it is, how he felt. But he was so sincere and so beautiful that he was well supported. Let me see if I can find... Uh,
Well, enough of hearing from his speech. What I want to say is that there is still war raging. I think we need to reflect on how we want to transform the world. Will it be as Terry Dobson? Will we become a martial artist? You can be a person of peace as a martial artist. That was the message of Terry Dobson, that Aikido is about transforming your opponent rather than decking your opponent. Or you might elect, as Dan Berrigan has elected, as I have elected, to be a nonviolent person. I've confronted raging, violent people. I remember vividly a Hell's Angel who wanted to kill me and was frightened away because after he bloodied my nose and bloodied my clothes, I just stood there continuing to smile at him thinking, I love you and I'm not afraid of you and I'm not going to become violent with you because I don't believe in violence. And he was transformed, I know it. So I think that that's one of the keys. We have to search our own heart and soul. Who am I? What, what gifts have I got that can make this a better world? Let me dedicate myself to those gifts that I have that will make this a better world. And follow your conscience. Be yourself. Celebrate yourself. Love yourself. We can make this a world of peace and love and compassion, beauty and truth. All that we need resides inside us right now, today, Father's Day, 2014. I'm happy to be a father. I'm happy to be a grandfather. And I'm happy to be in this beloved community. Thank you very much.